Hello and welcome to What Is It About the Weather, where weather is always a theme, but your weather is not the topic. Now this week we're going to be discussing non-aqueous rain. That's right, what is that stuff falling from the sky? But before we jump into the main topic, let me just say I hope you've had an interesting and enjoyable weather and weather entwined week out there. I know in the weather enterprise, probably the, the most interesting story I came across this week really had to do with anomalously warm weather that's been going on up in the Arctic area over, it's not just the past few days, it's been going on for a while now, but really pronounced in, in the last week or so. A good article right up in the Washington Post, Capital Weather Gang, link in the show notes as always. It'll give you a summary if you want to read a little bit more. But I think one of the, the things that's intriguing about it is we're in a period of solar night. So this stuff is occurring with no sunlight directly over the region. Now, again, keep in mind that the sun's really never high in the sky over the polar region. But it's it's intriguing when you think about the fact that it's other areas in in weather patterns as a whole and what's going on in North America or what's going on in Eurasia that are all intertwined and that are at play here. So if it's a story that interests you, check the show notes. You can read a bit more about it or, or Google it, and you can certainly come across some, some different ways to get caught up on it. All right, so let's jump into the main topic. Non-aqueous rain. What exactly is that stuff that's falling from the sky that's, well, not aqueous rain? Now, this whole topic was born out of the concept of, could Sharknado happen? I've been asked that a, a lot of times, and, you know, I couldn't put that off forever. I really had to dig into it, and the feasibility, you know, it, it just because uh, something's in a movie doesn't make it real, right? But I, I think people want to believe at some fundamental level that Sharknado really could happen. So let, let's determine if it's possible. Let's determine if it's possible. But to get to that final question, and let, let's use that as our kind of an ultimate thing that we're trying to answer is could Sharknado happen? But we got to understand a lot of more uh, minute processes and details to even get to the concept of considering Sharknado effectively. Now, when you think about meteorology and it, it, as a whole, what does it really mean? I mean, we're we're thinking about processes and phenomenal phenomena that occur in the atmosphere, right? And so fundamentally, things that go on in the atmosphere are related to meteorology. So you could argue that, I, I guess, non-aqueous rain would be sort of a fringe meteorology sort of thing. Since conceptually what we're talking about is events taking place that are meteorology related that are somehow delivering a non-meteorologically related aspect. So throwing stuff on you from the sky that, that has nothing to do with uh, what we would consider normal precipitation or normal atmospheric behaviors or processes. So let's define fundamentally then, I guess, what, what is non-aqueous rain. And let's start with, let's back up and do aqueous rain or even precipitation straight up. So precipitation really is any liquid or solid phase aqueous particles that originate in the atmosphere, and I think that's an intriguing thing, originate in the atmosphere and fall to the Earth's surface. So you you would say that rain is really only rain if it originates in the atmosphere. Now, tricky kind of thing there, right? It's it's when you think about it, well, all this moisture doesn't it come from the Earth originally? Yes, it does. As as water vapor evaporation occurs all the time, it's what delivers moisture into the atmosphere that can drop down as rain. Now, that that part is true, but it doesn't become rain until it recondenses, you know, around nuclei matter in, in the atmosphere and then falls out as rain. So it's tricky, you know. So you, you could argue that it doesn't become precipitation or even meteorology oriented until it goes into that phase, although meteorology would tell you it's a cycle. You know, it's you know, we got hydrological processes going on. You know, water leaves the earth, water comes back to the earth. It might come as solid, might come with new things, might have left the earth with some contaminants involved. No matter what, I you know, it, it it's still kind of loosely. And I, I think it's important here that, you know, we're talking about natural processes, right? We're talking about a, kind of a cycle going on. So you could argue that non-aqueous stuff, you know, probably excludes man-made things. If a tor tornado picks up the house and it falls or picks up a, a car and it falls or papers that can be strewn a couple hundred miles away, that really wouldn't be considered meteorology per se or some sort of non-aqueous rain. But 
you are still talking about something, a meteorological process that caused that to occur. So it is loosely related, and, you know, it's a, it's a real-world impact. So, again, we get into this whole thing that weather's intertwined no matter how you slice it. So I, I do think we can exclude kind of man-made objects in the discussion about non-aqueous rain because, quite frankly, we, we understand and we've seen those go up, right? We've seen enough tornado videos to know that a tornado can tear apart a house and, you know, deliver debris hundreds of miles, like I said, further down downwind of, of where that tornado went. And that's easy to document because a lot of times there's actually written text and things like that on it. So then we get into this concept, let's toss out man-made and let's focus on the natural. And you could argue that there's other natural things, you know, I don't know, hurricane or a tornado or whatever could pick up other debris, whether it's tree parts or grass or leaves or whatever it might be and depose that down thing and people don't usually use that to describe rain either so usually when people are talking about non-aqueous rain they're talking about something falling like precipitation okay but that that most often is a or was at some point a living creature so Hence its connection to Sharknado, but that's really where the topic focuses in on. Again, you could argue a little the minutia of should it include these other things or is it really rain? But I, I think the intriguing thing is so often these events are described as things falling from the sky like rain that, you know, that that's why it, it's lumped with this non-aqueous rain title. So to get into the modern day, we, we first need to step back, of course, and look at the history of non-aqueous rain and where did the discovery or kind of the topic come up. Now, some people argue that if you look back at ancient Egypt and stories of the Bible about frogs, for instance, which is one of those creatures that is said to be, you know, falling from the sky, that that story really was written about frogs coming out of the, the river or the Nile. So I think it's, you know, that one's a little tougher. But clearly there's documentation there's even a piece of artwork that was done in the, I want to say, 1350 time frame, depicting frogs, again, falling from the sky. And so there has been documentation that is hundreds of years old of these events taking place. So water creatures tend to be the most common, right? The frogs, fish, um, things of that nature, Okay, sharks, okay. We don't have documented cases of sharks, but we, we have a movie to prove it, right? Any case, water creatures, yes, but they're not alone, okay? So things like spiders, things like birds, things like worms, and you could argue that worms are kind of in that moist soil combination with frogs, but but certainly, again, not, not something that lives in the water or, or marshy areas necessarily, so snakes, all, all these different things come into play. So it, it again, a lot of water creatures are most often fish and, and frogs seem to be the most common occurrence, but they're certainly not alone. Now, I think the other thing to keep in mind that's interested is if you look back at the reported cases, right, that it's, you know, roughly one to two a year, which is pretty intriguing when you think about it in the last, you know, since... I, I want to say BBC ran an interesting little video, and there's a clip on it just because it shows a visual of, of about how it could happen that I'll put in the show notes that talks about, you know, in the previous 100 years, I think there had been 300 reported cases. Now, we'll get into are all those legitimate, but let's assume even there, that there's one a year. And there's some places where in particular seasons it seems to happen on a regular recurring basis, whether it's, you know, once a year, once every couple of years. So you know, not rare, rare, but certainly not an everyday occurrence by any means. Now, let's talk about fundamentally how this could happen. And to do that, we really need to talk about what we think is the primary source of this occurring. Now, if you think about pulling something out of a water source versus just lifting it up, there, there's, there's winds that, you know, and even updrafts, and we've talked about in thunderstorms, but the vertical motion, most of the intense vertical motion isn't happening near the surface. And the exception of that are when we get into things of tornado in being involved or, or tornadic in nature. 
And we have to talk about water spouts versus tornadoes. And, you know, I there's nuances. And quite frankly, even in reading different definitions of a water spout versus a tornado versus a tornadic water spout, fundamentally we're talking about events that occur near the surface that have vertical motion near the surface or sucking power, you know, or, or, you know, we can talk about the science of the pressure changes that would allow something to be lifted. Now we know in their documented cases of tornadoes literally moving over, let's say a, a, a pond and all the water being removed. Now some of it's going to be removed through dispersion, things through around. And this is the same thing when you think about a traditional water spout over water is when you're seeing a water spout, most often the water in the column you're seeing is not lifted from below. It's condensation occurring. But if you look near the surface, you'll see, even in a water spout, even these weaker events, and that's generally, fundamentally, even if we don't know all the details, water spouts are generally most often not as strong. Okay, But near the surface, you can still see it throwing water around. So there is this, this kind of rotation going on, this movement going on, and in the column, there is upward movement. Now, the more intense the water spout or the tornado, the more vertical motion is in play, right? So you've got these, these different things going on that could lift something out of a water area, whether it's a pond or a lake or an ocean, you've got things that could move something from land itself. And the reason that it's believed that tornadoes or, and or water spouts are more likely involved is there's really not an understanding of other things that could in mass lift things out of the water, I think, more than anything else. There are things in, you know, in, in, Many of us may have even experienced strong winds or other things that could kick up, or even a dust devil, another tornadic type event, right, that could lift things off the ground. The question's always going to be, is it strong enough to lift heavier things, such as not just a, a tadpole or a little minnow, but a larger fish? And pulling things out of the water in such a way, and I think there's an in, in intriguing thing to keep in mind is there are cases where this has happened and whatever has fallen from the sky right is still alive now if you think about let's take a spider that probably the only video I, I think that I came across that shows an actual event of, of creatures falling from the sky was this video of spiders now we all know that spiders use the wind to just be moved. So I that one I'm like, oh, there's a lot of things. Just strong winds could have done it with spiders. They could be higher up to begin with. They don't need to be as low. And so they catch a good breeze. Or even birds, right? A lot of times I think the cases of birds um, that actually more likely are not going to have survived is things that are occurring within the atmosphere, um, a sudden atmospheric event that caused a death. Of, of birds or, you know, an abrupt event that caused the death of birds. But these spiders lived, okay? But it's easy to me to describe a way spiders is not necessarily being anything unusual. But if you think about a fish or an eel or a shark or anything that lives in the water, to have survived, one of two things has had to happen. They were thrown up in the air with so much water around them that they were able to continue breathing or or the event happened really close by, okay? So we've got these kind of elements going on, and that explains, you know, some of the conditions we have to put around it. But that's not to say that all these cases, you know, people like to throw in um, cases where kind of dismembered body or, or shredded body parts uh, from animals have, have occurred. And those, are again, are more easy for me to explain through some of the, the processes we've already discussed. So we get into this s scenario that it seems most plausible. The challenge is it's never been witnessed, but how in the world, if a tornado is going over a pond, are you likely to be close enough to witness fish being pulled up into it? It's not likely. We are more likely to see the outcome, okay? And do keep in mind that when a tornado occurs, stronger, you know, the further the distance or the further it can throw things, keep that in mind, or the more intense it might be in terms of what it sucked up to begin with. But all these things get tossed in the atmosphere, and there's a lot of things once it gets in the atmosphere 
that can keep things up there. Now, the heavier, the less likely it's going to fall far away. I mean, if you think about it, though, tornadoes can pick up rail cars and move them, you know, in excess of hundreds of meters. I mean, that that sort of thing has been documented. So it's not implausible to think about it picking up animals, especially small ones. I mean, you know, I think it's important maybe to even equate that. So you think about a hailstone or something like that. I mean, hailstones can weigh in excess of a pound, but even... You know, common frogs, some common species are a fifth of that. So even if you talk more regular hailstones, I mean, they can weigh similar to these small animals. So it's not inconceivable that once these things get up in the atmosphere that they're tossed around. And and with all these cases, if you look at it, the more documented cases tend to be smaller creatures. They don't tend to be huge creatures. The other interesting thing I think we have to throw in it is quite often they're the same creatures. And this gets back into, to me, the water element in that, and it's not just water, though. You think about creatures, they tend to exist in schools or in groups that are of similar nature, birds, flocks of birds. You know, I I don't know enough about frogs to be able to speak to this, but I, you know, I watched a frog hatching season occur a couple of springs ago in an area that I was visiting for the first time. And they were all over the place. And it was one species of frog. I mean, I literally could not walk down the road without not nearly stepping on one every step or two. So it's not uncommon in nature to see these concentrations of creatures, right? So we've got that element going on. We've likely got these tornadoes or tornadic type events picking these animals up and distributing them downwind. Now, When we talk about the schools, again, it's kind of logical that groups of certain things, and you may say, okay, well, if it picked up a whole pond or if it picked up a, I don't know, a part of the ocean or whatever it might have been, wouldn't it be a little more mixed? Well, maybe, maybe not. Again, depends on, again, we've all watched videos of schools of fish, and it's just that fish. Now, there may have been other types, but the other thing to keep in mind is if other types are around, they may be predatory. And if they got picked up, they may have been dropped somewhere else because they were heavier. So the like things of like size and weight are more likely to be deposited together. All right. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, like I said, is we've got this non potential of non tornadic involvement, and I do think that broadens what could be picked up. But for the concept of talking about Sharknado, and and again, with the vast majority of creatures, it still seems, tornadoes still seem the most plausible, okay? There's also this understanding that when these events take place, just because you have a big rain event and all of a sudden you see a school of fish swimming around in a puddle in an area, doesn't necessarily mean or a a bunch of worms crawling around in a puddle, that they came from the sky. There are plenty of cases, and this has been documented as well, where waterways are breached, okay, or, you know, an overflow situation occurs or flooding occurs, and even if briefly, you know, some sort of flash flood that washes a group of fish or, or, you know, other creatures together, worms would be a good example, where some area with a lot of worms in the dirt gets flooded and they get flushed into a drainage-oriented area, and all of a sudden, it, you know, logic, you know, doesn't necessarily come into play immediately, and people want to think, oh, they came from the sky. So there are cases where that's not exactly what's been going on. But all that aside, plenty of cases where things, and, and again, recent cases, there are even some still pictures of fish falling from the sky. But if you look around, it's also occurring during a storm-type event. So... Not going to delve into the fair weather versus foul weather scenario. There wasn't really enough information. So let's just, let's just stay with the basics. Let's summarize the basics that we've got at this point, right? Likely a tornadic or that type of event, right? To have enough power to really get up different creatures, okay? It doesn't necessarily have to be right around the source, but the heavier the item, the less likely it's going to be distributed further away and we need to keep things alive if we're getting back to our sharknado premise now we've proven all these things can happen 
Okay, but let's talk about the concept now. Let, let's do, let's pull ourselves out of the sides and let's talk about could Sharknado really occur? Now I came across, it, like I said, in all this research, a variety of things that tornadoes could lift. We've discussed some of those from rail cars. I, you know, it picks up homes and destroys homes, so of course it could carry these heavy things, right? There was a, a good article and that kind of summarizes the paths of tornadoes. You know, someone else has looked at this before me. I'm not. I'm not new to this topic of sh could Sharknado really occur? I mean. Of course it could occur. It's in a movie, right? And there have been four movies. This is the part that still baffles me is how they keep making these things and people keep watching them. Well, we all like to watch um, entertainment, whether we find it plausible, believable. Um, sometimes it may be laughable, but we tend to keep going back, which is why they can tend to keep making these things. But for Sharknado to occur, right, we, we know that sharks are of a weight that they could be picked up, all right? Now, a couple things that you could argue against it is what's the likelihood of a bunch of sharks being around? Well, I don't know about you, but if you've ever watched videos, particularly in the last few years, helicopters over maybe areas around Florida's beaches where just offshore there's these huge schools of sharks. So we have a constant now we have a concentration of sharks, right? But we need those tornadoes to a strong enough tornado to occur near water, which they can do not as frequent they don't happen as often but they do occur but we also need that tornado or that tornadic type event to then go over land and deposit these sharks right so strong enough to carry the creatures yes we know it can do it going back over land if it's been over water most likely you want a tornado that's formed over land first because those tend to be more intense although there are areas where stronger water based tornadoes or tornadic events do occur they're not as common around the u.s most of ours tend to be land-based but there are areas where strong tornadic water spouts as some people like to call them have occurred or do occur quite often in in regions and, and they tend to be more around europe but again can happen anywhere right but the other thing for shark native fundamentally occurs. So I, I I give them all that. Let let's stop for a minute and say yes, it can be done. Yes, these tornadoes can be can be done. And like I said in this article, he does a whole math of all the the tornado paths in the U.S. and the ones that have crossed from land over water and then back over land. And that that's the you know the intriguing part. And not just any piece of water, but water with sharks in it, right? So one could argue that if we use those Florida sharks as an example, either it would have to have been a tornado that formed over water or one that formed over, you know, a bay, one side of a bay. Maybe like, I don't know, an example might be in the Tampa Bay area. But this one, he showed a great example of one in uh, the Outer Banks of, of North Carolina, a very strong land-based tornado going over the ocean and then hitting the Outer Bank Islands. So we're going to believe all that for a moment, but the last part you need, let's assume that the, the sharks really did get dumped from the sky and they survived that endeavor, which means they weren't up there too long, right, is you need waters that are going to support that shark when it lands because, you know, it, it can get in the sewer, but it's got to get to the sewer initially. So you still need a fair amount of water because they're not all going to magically fall in the sewer. Now, I guess you could argue that they got deposited magically in some sort of brackish reservoir. Again, we get into which type of shark could survive. Um, some sharks do better in brackish waters than others. But what would you would probably benefit most from is if there was a fair amount of oceanic water that was in and around the area at hand. Now, the way you do that is you would need a hurricane or something of that magnitude to drive a ocean water driven flood so now you need this element and let's keep in mind that hurricanes can spawn tornadoes i mean some of them are, are more likely to do that than others but it certainly can happen so we've got a hurricane it's flooded areas in and around a bay area and a tornado unleashes goes over water strong enough to pick up sharks deposit them into the community so that they can you know, swim around and terrorize in this flooded area. So is it possible? Actually, 
It is. Is it likely? Uh, no. But that doesn't matter, does it? I mean, it takes all the fun out of any movie if, if you're always looking for stuff that's easily plausible. So, I hate the concept of saying something is or isn't possible versus probable. But in this case, we need to say, Sharknado, is it possible? Yes. And then in a little subtitle, is it ever going to happen in our lifetimes? Mm, Not likely. But that means that they can keep making them and keep coming up with plausible ideas. Now, one of the things where it's, you know, if you want to say odds are, are really slim on Sharknado ever occurring, the odds of them happening in and around an area like Los Angeles, where we're unlikely to get a hurricane or a tornado, to be going, it, it further decreases the potential of that occurring. Now, maybe when the San Andreas Fault breaks loose, if it were, and that spawned hurricanes with tornadoes uh, because somehow all that's related. I'm sure there's an action movie in there somewhere. But end of day, the intriguing thing is it's not impossible. No matter how implausible it may be, it's not impossible. In the show notes, you're also going to find an interesting leak of somebody who did a, an example showing how fish could be transported. Now, they did it with uh, little goldfish, you know, little crackers. But it was an interesting experiment that I'll put in the show notes for you. So if you really want to delve into this topic some more, not only can you get in an, to non-aqueous rain, you can make your own fish fly into the sky and be deposited somewhere else without having any animal rights activist group come after you unless they somehow will start putting on under the umbrella goldfish crackers, which could be kind of tricky because people also eat them all the time. So I hope you've enjoyed this dive into non-aqueous rain. Um, it's a, it, it's an intriguing topic. There's not been a ton of research on it, or, you know, by any means. If you type in non-aqueous rain, a lot of times you, you'll get the thing, but if you look for scholarly articles, you tend to get more of just the, concept of non-aqueous which really gets an atmospheric chemistry because uh, it is a, a phrase that they use quite often but I digress let's let's stay out of the science at this phase and I, I'm all for um, Sharknado 5 I know 4 didn't go over very well and the, the despite I mean I love reading reviews about this right so it lost the charm of the previous when you read reviews like that you you know (laughs) you're in uncharted territory but maybe Sharknado 5 will be the comeback the one that you know gets all the science right and uh, is really believable with the same characters again and again Uh, okay that's not likely either any case I'm going to let you go now. I'm going to let you get on with your weather entwined week. And uh, next time, I think we're going to be talking about weather and, and the pain equation. You know, we've talked a lot about the psychology element of it, but I want to talk about the some of the real world implications for how weather impacts how we feel, not just emotionally, but how we feel physically. So keep an eye out for that. I think that's what we'll, we'll probably get to next time around. And it's time again for another... Um, did weather change history episode? So, yeah, we'll, we'll hit on those topics in the next few weeks. Now, let me just say, for those of you in the U.S. who we won't, uh, we won't speak again until after this episode, may you have a good Thanksgiving. And for those of you in other parts of the world, I, I continue to be amazed at all the news. I, I almost tweeted something out the other day, and I didn't, that we now have listeners in the country of Georgia and the, and the state of Georgia. It's always weird when I'm looking at the statistics about the podcast and where the listeners are and whatnot that you know I can go on a given day and know that my voice has been heard on five continents it's a little strange but uh, hopefully hopefully all of you are finding some both some educational and informative and entertainment value in all of this podcast because it's it's through stuff that's enjoyable that hopefully we all grow and learn new things and find them interesting of course so Time to let you go. You know how to reach me. What is it about the weather at gmail.com for comments, thoughts, feedbacks, anything you might want to add. The website, what is it about the weather.com, catching up with the episodes, finding out ways to support us. You know the RSVP story, rate, share, validate, and pledge. You can also find out where to subscribe, different different methods there. You can find ways to connect with us on social media, of course. So until next time, until next time, may you have enjoyable, 
but of course, always an interesting weather-entwined week.